Welcome to Emergency Chaos, where we provide tips and tricks to make you a better ER nurse. Today, we are going over pulmonary embolism, including what the workup consists of, how it's treated, specific nursing tips, and of course, going over what it is and signs and symptoms. At the end, like always, we're going to finish with the question of the day. So thank you for tuning in. So what is a pulmonary embolism? It's an obstruction of a pulmonary artery, and there's different types of obstructions, including blood clots, air embolisms, fat embolisms, septic embolisms, and amniotic fluid embolisms. But for the purposes of this lesson, we're just going to focus on blood clots. So PEs are significant because blood is blocked from going over to the lungs, causing a sort of a traffic jam. This prevents blood from reaching the alveoli and getting oxygenated. It also ultimately decreases the amount of blood that reaches the left ventricle, causing a decrease in cardiac output and hypotension. This traffic jam also leads to pressure building up within the pulmonary arteries, and this pressure or traffic jam piles all the way back to the right side of the heart, which is why the right ventricle also goes through dilation and pore contraction, adding to the hypotension. A key thing that will dictate treatment is differentiating whether the patient is hemodynamically stable or unstable. For example, a massive saddle PE where the blood clot is at the bifurcation of the pulmonary trunk, where it's split into the right and left pulmonary arteries. If, it, if the blood clot is there, it can limit the blood flow. And this can cause severe hemodynamic instability, requiring aggressive management and treatment. So what are the symptoms of a pulmonary embolism? Well, the most common are going to be shortness of breath, tachycardia, and tachypnea. So shortness of breath and tachypnea are as a result of the body realizing that you're having difficulty picking up oxygen, getting your blood oxygenated. So the body tries to compensate by having you breathe faster to get more oxygen into the lungs. The tachycardia is also as a response because the body increases the heart rate with hopes of perfusing the lungs more in order to get more oxygen from the air coming in, as well as to help with the hypotension that can be occurring. Other symptoms can include chest pain with breathing, of course, hypoxia and hypotension when severe, as well as signs of malperfusion like being altered and dizzy or lightheaded. Now, let's go a little bit into the causes. A big one for pulmonary embolisms or DVTs, as these can break off and end up in the lungs. So when assessing your patient with PE-like symptoms, you should also go down to the legs and look for signs of a DVT like unilateral, swelling, and or pain. Then you should ask about then you should ask your patients about activities that limit movement and blood flow like long flights and long car rides as blood will pull down in the legs increasing the risk of DVTs because if the patient for example suddenly started getting short of breath after a long flight or a long car ride and perhaps one of their lower extremities also got swollen and painful then it's likely the patient had a DVT and now has a PE also, keep in mind that there are hypercoagulable conditions like pregnancy, being on birth control, cancer, or even having a recent surgery that increase the risk of blood clotting in the patient and then ending up with a DVT or PE. Now, let's talk about the workup. One thing I do want to mention is that providers have to rule out other explanations for the patient's symptoms. So things may be ordered that just aren't for the PE, but to rule out or rule in other conditions. This applies to pretty much all the workups as the provider has to be a sort of a detective to figure out what is going on. For example, as we discussed, the symptoms of a pulmonary embolism include shortness of breath and chest pain, but those symptoms can also be a manifestation from a heart attack, pneumonia, etc. The list goes on and on, but that's why the provider has to roll out different tests to roll out different conditions. So now let's go into the workup of a PE. Let's first start off with the denimer, which when ordered, it's going to be on a blue top, the same one that the coagulations are obtained from, like the PT, PTT, and INR. So a D-dimer is a protein fragment that is a byproduct of a blood clot being broken down somewhere in the body. So when it's ordered and it comes back high, it signals the provider that further diagnostic testing needs to be ordered, like a CT pulmonary angiogram. If it comes back low or it's not present, then it signals the provider that, it, that a PE may not be the most likely cause for the patient's symptoms. So a D-dimer is not going to diagnose the PE, but it helps the team figure out if additional testing should be performed. Again, if it comes back high, it signals the team that more testing should be done like a CT pulmonary angiogram. Also, know that a D-dimer can also be elevated in conditions of high inflammation like malignancy and severe infections. 
The next test is going to be a CT pulmonary angiogram, where as the name suggests, contrast will be used to light up the pulmonary vascular to look for a PE. A side note is what if the patient is allergic to contrast or has really bad kidney failure? An alternative test is a VQ scan or a ventilation perfusion scan, where a patient breathes in a substance that is picked up on imaging, showing how well the air is moving within their lungs. Then it's inserted via a vein and seen if perfusion is also adequate, and they can see if there is a mismatch between the ventilation and perfusion. But typically, the CT is the go-to unless these specific contraindications are present. Next, an ECG will most definitely be ordered. The most common finding on an uh, electrocardiogram is going to be sinus tachycardia. So remember that the most common finding on an EKG is just going to be sinus tachycardia. But there are also fancy findings that are not as common, but they can show up sometimes like your right bundle branch block or evidence of right heart strain as shown by T wave inversion in leads V1 through E4 and a prominent S wave in lead 1 and a prominent Q wave in lead 3 and an inverted T wave in lead 3. But just remember for now that sinus tachycardia is the most likely finding on an ECG. Other tests include a bedside echo where the provider will, will look at the right ventricle looking for dilation and strain. A chest x-ray is typically normal for a PE, but there is also fancy stuff that shows up on there. But remember that a chest x-ray is also looking for other things to roll out like a pneumonia or a pneumothorax. Then to cover all the bases, a CBC, CMP, and a trope will most definitely be ordered as well. So now let's go into the treatment. As always, when a patient first arrives, the ABCs must be addressed. Please watch my ABCs video for further details. However, let's discuss a couple of things if your patient is getting intubated. As we know, if your patient is hypoxic and hypotensive, the risk of the patient crashing and coding during intubation is increased as the medications given will cause the patient to stop breathing and they won't be back while the provider is attempting to place the ET tube, contributing to the buildup of the acidosis. Then also the meds can also have an effect on the blood pressure. Plus the positive pressure can decrease the preload and contribute to the pulmonary vascular resistance, further decreasing the BP. So what can we do about this? Well, we can ensure we do appropriate pre-oxygenation, or we can also do, we can ensure that an experienced provider is doing the intubation. Plus we can have uh, vasopressors ready. Perhaps we can have a push dose of vasopressor ready just in case, or perhaps a small fluid bolus. Again, like always, the ABCs must be addressed for any patient coming into the ER. Now, as far as treatment, it goes back to how unstable they are. If a PE is present, but the patient is still relatively stable in a sense, then anticoagulation will occur. Heparin will be given as an IV drip. So heparin is not going to break the blood clot down, but it's going to prevent it from getting bigger, giving the body enough time to break it down on its own. If a PE is present but is super stable, then sub-Q Lovenox is also an option for treatment. On the other hand, if the patient is super sick, if the patient is actively crashing and the PE is large or in a crucial location like a large saddle PE like we discussed, then thrombolysis with TPA or TNK is indicated because the blood clot needs to be broken down to allow blood to start moving again. There's also other treatment options if somehow the patient is allergic to anticoagulation or thrombolytics. These include an IVC filter and an embolectomy. But just to summarize, the main ones are going to be anticoagulation with heparin or Lovinox. And then if the patient is severe and is actually really sick and hemodynamically unstable, then TPA or TNK is going to be needed. Thrombolysis will be needed to break whatever clot is there. For whatever reason, if those aren't viable options, an IVC filter and an embolectomy of the patient is more sick or also there just in case. Now let's go into specific nursing tips. So a key diagnostic test is the CT pulmonary angiogram. But what if you feel like your patient is not going to be able to lay down for the CT, is not going to be able to lay flat for the CT? One super quick thing that you can do is place the patient flat while they're still on the gurney in the room for a few seconds and gauge whether they're going to be able to handle it. Essentially, if you place the patient flat and they immediately start having a rough time, then they're not going to be able to go to CT as they're not going to be able to tolerate it. So you must communicate and plan with the team accordingly. If you anticipate your patient going to CT early on, know to place the IV in the upper forearm or in the AC. Ideally, an 18 gauge, but CT should also be able to take a 20 gauge for the 
or the CT that they're going to be performing. If your patient is super sick, anticipate needing multiple IVs for different things. So have at least two IVs. It's also super helpful having IVs in the forearm where you don't have to worry about the patient bending their arm. Also, if the patient is a woman of childbearing age, you must obtain a negative pregnancy test before going to CT. Depending on your facility, some might allow you to do the POC pregnancy test with blood instead of urine, but verify with your own facility or preceptor. I made a video on nursing tips related to thrombolysis on tips related to giving patients medications that are thrombolytics, but remember to limit invasive procedures after and to closely monitor your patient for bleeding complications, including head bleeds. If your patient is on a heparin drip, know that you're gonna be repeating the PTT every few hours, titrating to a specific goal set by the provider. So please review your own facility's uh, heparin drip protocol, okay? If your patient gets intubated, be prepared for the patient to crash during and immediately after, so be ready just in case that does happen. Learn what questions to ask, including questions about recent flights or long car rides, or if one of the lower extremities got swollen and started hurting. Of course, if chest pain is present, ask all the normal questions, ask and also ask if it gets worse with a deep breathing. That was a long lesson, but I'm glad you made it to the end. Now let's get to the question of the day. What should you do if your intubated patient suddenly starts desatting? Again, what should you do? What are the steps you should follow if your intubated patient starts desatting? As always, the answer to this will be at the bottom of the description text. Thank you for your time today. I hope that I was at least able to teach you one thing. If you want to keep learning, I've listed my favorite ER nursing related books in the description with my favorite being Sheehy's and the Case Files. As well, please take the time to watch my other videos. Also, if you would like to help support the channel, I do have some nursing stickers and shirts on Redbubble. So if you do have time, go ahead and check them out. But again, thank you for your time today. I hope you learned something. And as always, teamwork makes the dream work. And here at Emergency Chaos, we are proactive, not reactive. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in.